Hey, we're going a little early here with the interview, but welcome to Leo Silvestri. He is known as the Milkweed Man, all about monarch butterflies. Leo, how are you today? Good. <laughs> welcome, Excellent. Welcome to the show. Thank and, you for uh, having me, Spencer. Absolutely, no problem at all. Uh, very, very interesting all about these monarch butterflies. That's what you've been known in the community for years as the Milkweed Man. Well, it's been about six years you now since 2018 when we started. And, um, you know, since then, basically, by planting milkweed, digging up plants in front of uh, construction uh, bulldozers, uh, that's what gave me the uh, the nickname. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that's uh, that's big part of what attracts them, right? Yes, uh, actually, there's more into it. Uh, first, we plant all kinds of flowers, pollinator flowers, and native mainly, and then by adding milkweed into these uh, pollinator gardens, as we call them, we attract the monarch butterfly as well. Yes, yes, and um, how many days does it take for them to be? A little tiny egg go from that to being a monarch butterfly? It takes about 28 to 30 days. It depends on the air temperature in different parts of North America, but that's about the average. Yes, so uh, how many years have you been involved doing this uh, before joining your your group? Have you been doing this since you were uh, much younger? No, actually, (laughs) I was an old man still. I'm (laughs) uh, I'm getting older. Um, Back in 2018, uh, just before I retired, actually, in 17, uh, something strange happened to me. I saw a caterpillar in my concrete cement in the backyard, and then I got curious, and I said, you know, what the heck are this guy is doing over here? Before a bird picks it up, I brought it back to my parsley plant where it came from, and from there on, I did some researches later, uh, the year after, actually, and then I found out about the word the butterfly, uh, monarch butterfly, because up to that point, I had no idea what a monarch butterfly was in July 2017, and then this came about. So, yeah, you that that's how it started, because it was a caterpillar in your backyard, and you got curious and looked it up. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, have you really uh, dove deep in your research with all about monarch butterflies? Because I have a question for you. Yeah, no, no, we uh, we dug deep, actually, uh, a whole three months, the whole winter of 2017, uh, before I joined my first uh, butterfly group on Facebook. It was called The um, the Beautiful Monarch, with over 100,000 members right now. And uh, there were many experts over there that were uh, uh, teaching people how to do it properly, uh, you know, clean the cages and... Uh, wash the leaves and so on and so forth, and try to take care of the parasites that are usually uh, do create the problems for some of these monarchs. We'll get into the parasites a little bit later on, but uh, you you studying into all this, um, this is a question from our station manager, actually. He wanted to know, do you study the mimicry rings? Uh, No, anything that has to do with high tech scientific uh, part, we just read whatever is online. Mm-hmm. We have many websites that provides us all the information, the answers that we're looking for. Uh, Sometimes we do share articles, you know, among the different groups. And so we have a community of scientists, actually, that guides us, you know, and these people have been doing it for 20 years or more uh, with all the different stories and, you know, different findings. Yes, yes. Okay, so for the people out there that are really, really interested and want to start raising monarch butterflies, um, what what is the process like? Do you need a license for that? Uh, Yeah. If you live in the uh, province of Ontario, uh, you you need a permit to to raise more than one. So in other words, (laughs) nobody's going to do just one. Might as well just get the permit. They're free uh, from the Ministry of Natural Resource and Forestry. And it's a a simple application that, you know, anybody can fill. Now, when we found out about this permit a few years ago, um, we basically told all our members, you know, that this was a requirement. uh, And then everybody started sending information and requesting uh, this application to be filled. And obviously, our our, uh, office ministry uh, was not aware of, you know, this a huge amount of requests to come in all at once. And so what they did is 
they create one permit for myself and everybody else as an assistant under my own permit, which is also included in their own applications anyways. So it doesn't matter if you have five or ten uh, applicants with you, uh, five or five to ten assists, sorry, uh, or a hundred or five hundred, you know, it doesn't matter. So that's what we're doing now. We're all fully licensed under the uh, Federal um, Ministry of Ontario, and we're doing the right thing according to them. Uh, actually, we have the one of the ministry office member of our group, he just joined a few months ago, uh, just probably wants to see what we have in mind to do in 2024. And when he saw some of our program, I got many compliments from him that, you know, we are doing the right thing to take care of the monarch butterflies in our area. Oh, that's great. That's great. And uh, for the people who may not know out there, what are some of the benefits of uh, raising the monarch butterflies? What are some things that they do for all of us? Well, what they do basically is an individual answer. You know, I can only answer for myself and the majority of the people that I deal with. Some of them do it uh, for spirituality reasons. Some of them do it to uh, release the stress. Like during COVID, for instance, we had a lot of nurses, uh, teachers that, you know, do the... the, uh, conditions of the be at home all the time they need the something to do you know to relieve their stress uh, and so they got into uh, raising monarchs so they came to our house we gave them a couple of caterpillars we told them what to do and then of course a couple of weeks later they came back for some more um, for the general uh, groups of people uh, in like, like you know different from different background I would say that it is their human uh, instinct that gets them to uh, save them from predators. See, not too many people realize that a lot of these eggs, 95 to 97%, that are laid on these milkweed plants will vanish through predators, whether it's an ant, a spider, uh, air wig, or whatever, d- depends on the area you know, where the eggs are laid. There's all kinds of predators, and these are facts. I mean, you know, it's published everywhere online through scientific research. So this is one of the reasons why this population is constantly diminishing, you know. Not too many people realize that aspect because everybody is concentrating on providing more milkweed and more flowers uh, along the migratory route uh, that goes to Mexico. But we that are in the trench, we're not working from a lab, obviously. We cannot come up with scientific you know, mm-hmm. research on everything. But generally speaking, it's the human mind and the human heart that comes into place mm-hmm. when it comes to the monarch. And are these monarch butterflies, are they okay or are they kind of near extinction? Is that a big reason for uh, breeding? No. Uh, first of all, let me rephrase that. Breeding, uh, a lot of people confuse uh, commercial breeding like farmers, uh, monarch breeders that do sell them online for funerals or um, wedding events, you know, so on and so forth, the birthdays even uh, of rich people, obviously, because not too many people could afford to buy those monarchs, you know, hundreds of monarchs to be released on, a, on, a, uh, on any given event. Our concept is simply called, everybody calls it different. We use the uh, protect, raise, and release. In other words, we're getting the eggs from our own plants in our own garden or maybe a neighbor, you know, down the street. And then we bring them into an enclosure, which is uh, 100% safe for them. No insect, no predator can go in and no caterpillar can go out. So obviously, he is forced to eat until he becomes a butterfly. (laughs) And that's what, uh, you know, we're all hoping for. (laughs) Yes, yes. Very interesting interview so far. We are going to take a quick break. We're going to go to a song break. And Leo and I will be back after this. Still plenty more to talk about, plenty more questions all about these monarch butterflies. CKBG The Berg, welcome back to the interview with Leo Silvestri, known as the Milkweed Man, all about monarch butterflies. And 
During our break here, we were talking off air all about the migration uh, in the fall. There's advantages you were telling me using local plants. Some local plants? Yes. Well, uh, native plants. Native plants, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, some native plants will do much better in the fall than others. So obviously it would be a good thing to plant them during the early spring or midsummer so that they will bloom during the migration, such as goldenrods, asters, and, and, and so on and so forth. Now, during the summer, though, because some gardens are not the same. All gardens are different, okay? Different locations, different whatever. And from what I understand from other people uh, in our group, in our groups and, and as well as others, is that some plants that are not uh, native will do just as good. So a good mixture, I would say, according to some experts I've heard in the different uh, presentation, that 70 Tory. 70% native, 30% non-native, will work with any butterfly or pollinator garden. But again, if a person has a preference to go 100% all native, by all means, just stick to the natives because eventually they'll eat uh, as long as they find something to eat. When they run out of food, they go elsewhere, that's all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And all this information is on your website, correct? Yes, our main website is the classical www.savethemonarchbutterfly.ca uh, savethemonarchbutterfly.ca Now, if you are getting involved locally here, in which this, uh, I'm assuming, that's what the whole reason of this interview is, even though your technology allows us to reach people in different parts of North America, uh, I want to stress the fact that you don't have to have a huge garden, you don't have to have uh, hundreds uh, of dollars invested uh, just to raise one or two little caterpillars and release them as butterflies because we have the advantage of having 2,900 members in our two counties, uh, Essex and, uh, Essex, uh, and Ch- Chatham yeah. Kent County, that we can provide anyone with two to five caterpillars we would give them enough leaves until they become uh, butterflies. All they need to do is get a 12 by 12, the smallest uh, size that we have you know, available, either at Amazon or they pick it up at our house, or the ones that will come to my place, you know, our home. Uh, I'll have those available for them. And just go for it, you know. Let uh, your little finger feel the uh, the touch of a butterfly once you release it. And if you don't experience anything, you don't want to do it anymore, that's fine. Just tell somebody down the street to tell another members of your family. We have a need to save as many as we can from predators. I cannot do them all alone. My members uh, or our members of our group cannot do it all alone in their own community because there are times where these female monarchs, they lay way too many eggs. <laughs> and that is, I mean, that's a lot of eggs, I'm telling you, you know, yes. as Spencer so. Yeah, yeah. And um, there was some uh, concerns a little uh, little bit ago that I wanted to touch up on, just, just ask you on air. Is there any uh, risk of transmitting diseases if you uh, breed too many? Uh, yes, it was told that when you uh, amass a huge amount of these caterpillars into an enclosure or into a closed area, it could create a problem, yes. But in our organization, as well as many others that I see on Facebook groups, uh, times have changed. They have learned a lot of new techniques. Uh, we do have new technology, even a little zoom you know 40 times or 60x zoom that you can get on amazon that will allow you to see if a monarch uh, is affected by oe we call it the oe anyway just to make a short it's one of the oe oe okay one of the parasites that basically concerns the monarch and for the most part it's basically just your typical washing the leaves bleach them if you, if you think you are in, a, in, a, in an area where 
you're heavily affected by these parasites. It's all, you know, it's like taking care of a baby, in other words, you know. <laughs> you need to do a little bit of work uh, for, for different parts uh, of the country. Like I said, here in Windsor, our statistic, according to the Natural uh, Ministry of Ontario, as well as some of the other scientific reports, um, we don't have a huge amount of OE. Maybe the other one towards the second or third generation when we're getting closer to August because, you know, they've been infected somewhere else and then they come to our area and that could be a little problem for some. So, But for the most part, we do have the permit by the uh, Ministry of Ontario telling us what the animal protocol procedures are. We follow them. We report every year. This was our first year with a full report, actually, before it wasn't done. Uh, last year was our first year, so this year would be our second. And he's very happy with what he sees in the area. And it, really, it is to our advantage to let the authorities and our Canadian scientists to know this, because when it comes the time to make a decision whether should we leave these people, keep doing what they're doing, or should we do like California did, hands off. And that would mean you would not be able to even to go close to one of your milkweed plants in your garden. And I don't think humanity, you know, would want something like that. So we all have to do our best. I mean, you know, the Mexican has to do their best in guarding the overwintering sites, you know, from the different activities that are going on there. I don't want to get into that. Uh, the Americans, of course, have to do their part and creating or supplying nectar into the corridor where these butterflies live. We are the one of the major producers, actually, in northern Canada, starting from North Ontario down, that are a big part of the migratory because they all funnel into Point Pelee to cross the lakes, or here in Amherstburg, some prefers to go by land. Uh, obviously, the they're not, they can't swim. They figure, you know, they're afraid of water, <laughs> whatever the reason. Uh, some actually right from Holiday Beach. Not too many people know this, but, you know, people that have been going there to watch the Blue Jay migration have found that the monarchs also cross from uh, Holiday Beach. So, you know, uh, it, it, it is a responsibility uh, of all the tri-country uh, tri as... Uh, uh, as they say online, but it's also uh, a, a human responsibility on a local level to do your best to create the pollinator gardens for bees and other mm -hmm. butterflies. And, you know, and when we plant for monarch, we're actually planting for the three bees, birds, bees and butterflies so, so it's all good it's all good yeah it's all good <laughs> well i hope that uh really really helped anybody out there that was having some concerns all about uh whether it led to transmission of diseases with overpopulating overbreeding but um, before i let you go i want you to talk about you got some events coming up correct yes i do uh actually we do <laughs> uh saturday on april the 13th will be uh, between a 10 and 4, will be a Jack Miner. Uh, I'm sure everybody here in the county uh, knows where Jack Miner is. Sunday, April the 21st, from 10 to 3, will be at the Malden uh, Park in Windsor for the Earth Day celebration. Sunday, June the 16th, uh, of course, will be a big day here in, in uh, Amherstburg, at uh, 320 Richmond Street for our third annual Egg to Butterfly Workshop. This is something that it was hosted by the LaSalle and Amherstburg Horticultural Society. I'm just a guest speaker there, and anyways, uh, <laughs> I'll do my best to, you know, to put my input. But many of these ladies and many uh, of their members, they're already uh, pretty expert in what they're doing. And then on Sunday 23rd, June the 23rd, from 10 to 4, will be again at Front Road in La Salle for another summer market event with over 100 vendors. And this event is hosted by Janine Jewelry. I want to thank uh, Janine for inviting us 
to be part of that. And on, on Sunday, August the 25th, of course, is our fourth Butterfly Festival on Erie Street and Langlois Corner in Windsor. We call it Via Italia, but you know, don't mind that, just call it Erie Street. And uh, our cement, cemented garden this year, for the first time, will be um, filled with what we call an educational life of butterfly exhibit. It will not be more or less than uh, uh, 10 by 15 or 10 by 20. I'll have to see what I can fit in there because my buddy Craig Oveson from the uh, Craig of the Butterfly Man dot com uh, has been pushing that this idea has worked in his own um, in his own neighborhood in Connecticut. And he says, you know, once you have uh, some of these educational live butterfly exhibit and all the um, vendors of the flowers, you know, like nurseries and all of that, plus one in your own home, you will see that people will get more interested in what, what, what you're doing simply by coming in and, and, and take a look at a butterfly and touch it, you know. So I said, okay, we'll, uh, we'll do that. But other than that, basically, I just want to close with this. Thank you for listening to uh, an old Italian retired painter <laughs> uh, who fell in love with, uh, with the dumb green worm that was, you know, uh, going around the cement. But really, take a look at the, uh, at the internet, look for whatever it is that you want to learn. Go to Google and search any topics that you want to know. And then, you know, decide for yourself uh, whether you want to help the pollinators or the monarch or anything else that nature provides. We can only do our part with the monarchs because, you know, <laughs> it, it has taken a part of our heart. Uh, and so we're dedicated with that. But we're always open to help and, you know, guide other people through different, um, different uh, aspects of the uh, nature. And at the same time, uh, God bless and visit our website, Save the Monarch Butterfly.ca. If you're in Canada, especially if you're in Essex County, and if you are in the States, you want to be more elaborate about it, join the Craig the Butterfly Man group. They have over 300,000 uh, members right now. It's probably going to be the largest monarch conservation organization in the whole North America. Thank you and God bless. Well, thank you, Leo, for joining us. Great things you're doing. Like you said, the three B's, birds, bees, and butterflies help pollinate with that. But uh, specifically talking about the monarch butterflies here, some very, very interesting things. Like you said, check out their website. And thank you so much for joining us here on the Berg. Thank you for having me. Hello and welcome. This is Leo Silvestri coming to you from Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Uh, I gotta tell you, I feel a lot better in front of my computer rather than being in the, um, on the radio station booth. But anyways, I want to thank CKBG 107.9 FM for that opportunity. And, uh, and I also want to thank you in particular for listening uh, to the interview, whether it was recorded or live. The reason I found... Um, a necessity to add a few more comments. It was due to the fact that I did not understand a couple of the questions and one in particular I didn't even answer uh, you know, fully. So bear with me a couple of more minutes and I'm going to cover these couple of questions and couple of comments you know, that I would like to add to the interview. Thank you. And so the first one was basically about the milkweed at the beginning. Um, as you heard, <laughs> milkweed, the milkweed men, you know, that's what they call me around here anyways. They're also in some of our groups on uh, Facebook. And the reason for that wasn't that only uh, because we dug all the mature plants and basically brought it into some of our neighbor's gardens. But it was also um, a, a, a different activity that we took upon ourselves from the beginning with my best friend around here was to collect uh, 
milkweed, common milkweed from different fields, a different area of our city and county. And then we talk at home, we clean them, uh, dry them, put them in the refrigerator. And I often tell people uh, locally here that uh, I have two fridges at home. One is for the, uh, the food, <laughs> for me and my wife. And the other one is literally for milkweed. So in order to get the cold stratification, I keep them in my fridge so that every time I give them out to different events uh, and so forth, they are ready basically to be planted. And we went through, I would say, over a million seeds, you know, in the last six years, maybe even more, even though some of them, they probably never germinated, never even went to the uh, potting soils because, you know, people take anything for free anywhere just to, to make you happy. And then once they go home, who knows what they did with them anyways. But I know that a good majority of our local gardeners uh, at, uh, have taken, you know, the the, uh, the cause very seriously, and and I know for a fact that, that they they plan them anyways. Uh, as far as the other question there about the male and female, uh, my wife brought this out after the interview, <laughs> and I felt funny, as I, as if I didn't know what the difference between a male or a female monarch is. So for you, in case you don't know, uh, there's two different way, different ways of seeing the difference. One is in the thin uh, vein of the male towards the female. In other words, the female has a thicker black vein on, on the wings. But the most popular item that everybody is looking for, the two little spots on the wings, telling you that is a male. So that was that. The other part was the migration um, uh, question that I did not answer. And actually, uh, I don't know if Spencer mentioned the word endangered or not, but anyways, it was something that triggered a lot of people across North America um, because of the IUCN, you know, declared endangered and then later they change that to threaten, you know, threatened species. So in other words, our migration will always be there. It's been uh, established by many scientists, including Chip Taylor from the monarchwatch.org. Uh, it's just a question of understanding the numbers that are more important going to Mexico in the fall versus the migration coming north, because as, lo as little as the northward bound um, in the spring is, they always have the ability to recolonize themselves and do better during the following year. But obviously, we don't want it to get to the uh, lowest point where everybody is going to be wandering all summer long where are the monarchs? You know, why have I don't see any monarchs in my garden? So for that reason, we need to increase the uh, south migration numbers so that uh, some of them, we're sure they will be dying in the way there due to different, uh, different reasons. Some will starve, some will not have enough food, some will encounter drought, some will get hit by a train, by a car in the highway. Uh, you know, all kinds of things uh, can happen. Mother Nature, of course, uh, it, it, the climate change has also a lot to do. But, you know, beside all that, and beside all the ones that don't make it uh, over the overwintering grounds there in Mexico, we still have a huge number that will come back in the spring and hopefully, uh, you know, recolonize fast enough to get into our northern gardens. That's the whole the whole point there. Um, and the other thing I wanted just to, I forgot to mention, uh, to thank the um, horticultural groups of um, La Salle and uh, Amherstburg Horticultural Society for uh, their involvement in creating the uh, third annual egg, the butterfly 
workshop where people actually sit down and learn how to raise just a few we're not after a massive raising in here this word the massive captive and all this you know nonsense that you hear online it's only there to discourage people from uh, from going close to an egg and take them into a flying stage in my opinion anyways uh, but nevertheless I want to thank Jan Dugdale and Carol DeShane for organizing this event and, and on top of that I personally want to thank Janet and Alan Arsenal for uh, all their um, these are from Chalet Studio and Garden Photography just at the Amherstburg area who are taking their time to create all our posters and helping us out with uh, photography you know whenever is needed and then of course I want to lastly but not least thank all our members um, admin moderators and everybody in general that jo joins our group for their uh, effort and try to increase the monarch population around our gardens and also ultimately to those that will go to Mexico and uh, other than that stay tuned for later because I got to I got to like this kind of thing and now <laughs> now that I went through the first uh, uh, shaking period there at the uh, radio station and stay tuned with the uh, YouTube channel uh, once you go to YouTube you can type in Leo Silvestri channel and it will come up automatically and you for and if, in case you forgot our website and what we're doing and you live here in Essex County or close by or even across North America doesn't matter just go to Google anytime you feel like it and type in Leo Silvestri S-I-L-V-E-S-T-R-I -E something will always come up and uh, because of there are other people obviously with my name look for the uh, the picture of myself or with a butterf with a monarch a butterfly on my nose on my face on my hand whatever you can find it that's me and uh, in closure I wanna again uh, thank you for listening to the uh, long <laughs> interview at the radio station if and for these other eight minutes I guess now there are way too many um, for listening to me and my little story and again a big thank you to uh, CKBG 107.9 FM in case you don't know they are playing easy listening music now that I found out I will be listening uh, more often because those are the songs that we all grew up with at least my generation from the 70s and it is a great music thank you and God bless